The United States is suing Apple. The Department of Justice argues the company has a monopoly over performance smartphones, those you might call premium or high-end, with 70% market share based on revenue. And in case that sounds like a made-up category, it's quick to point out that Apple also has 65% market share of all US smartphones. The implication is that monopolies are held to a higher standard. Things that are perfectly legal for a mom-and-pop operation become illegal under American law for firms with dominant control of the market. Apple, the DOJ claims, maintains this dominant position not with carrots, adding or improving features, or lowering prices, but rather with sticks, rules and restrictions that make it harder for users to leave and for other companies to compete. Its competitors are forced to innovate, whereas Apple has the option not to. Now, we'll leave the legal analysis to the legal experts. Between discovery, arguments, testimony, and appeals, this case will take years to unfold. But while it's premature to ask whether the DOJ will win, in the meantime, one question we can begin to answer is, will we? Should you and I, the victims this suit is intended to protect, be cheering the government on or worried that it may make the products we use worse? The 88-page complaint makes five major arguments, each of which we'll categorize as strong, weak, or debatable. Starting with super apps. If you don't know what a super app is, well, that's sort of the DOJ's point. Generally speaking, one app has one primary function. Calculator calculates. Messages, messages. Of course, this isn't always true. You can hail a ride, order food, and rent a car, all from Uber. But at some unclear point, there's no strict agreed-upon definition, an app has so many functions that it starts to eclipse iOS itself. If you do everything within a single super app, the phone it's running on becomes unimportant and thus interchangeable. A $200 Motorola is no different from a $1,200 iPhone. Now, Apple doesn't explicitly ban super apps. Presumably, the DOJ would argue that would be far too blatant. Instead, it prohibits apps from recreating, quote, alternate home screen environments. And because this rule is phrased so ambiguously, or perhaps because Apple has made exceptions, we don't have to speculate on whether super apps are a threat to its business. We know. Virtually every smartphone user in China relies on a super app called WeChat, which you can use to do everything from send messages to pay bills, hail a ride, and read the news. And as expected, Apple has struggled to grow its market share in the country, where consumers seem less loyal to any one particular brand. There are many reasons for this, no doubt, but WeChat is at least one. In other words, the DOJ is right. Super apps are bad for Apple. Its mistake, however, is in assuming that they must, therefore, be good for users. Would you want all 10, 20, or 100 of the apps on your phone squeezed into one? For most people, this would simply add an additional layer of complexity, one more intermediary between you and the task at hand, from Uber in iOS, for instance, to Uber in WeChat in iOS. Never mind that super apps merely replace one monopolist with another. American iPhone users are beholden to Apple. Chinese iPhone users are beholden to WeChat. The only difference is that we in America can choose our overlord, Android or iOS. Whereas in the world the DOJ imagines, one super app reigns supreme across all platforms. You might assume, as the DOJ surely does, that the popularity of WeChat in China is proof that consumers prefer using super apps. A more accurate historical account is not that users chose WeChat, but that WeChat was chosen for them. The Great Firewall kept out foreign competition. The Chinese government subsidized its national champions. And China's leapfrogging over credit cards led to widespread adoption of mobile payments all of which facilitated its rise from the top down. You might argue that consumers should at least have the option of using super apps. 
But as we saw with WeChat, that's rarely how it works. More often, retailers, banks, and automakers force us to use apps we don't like. Restricting super apps, yes, is good for Apple. It's also good for users. And that makes this argument a weak one. The next one is about cloud streaming. Ordinarily, when you do something on your iPhone like play a game, it all happens on your device. The faster and more capable your phone, the more and better games you can play. But it doesn't have to be this way. The game you're playing could be run on a computer in Fargo, Tallahassee, or Reykjavik, and transmitted live to your phone anywhere in the world. If your internet was fast enough, you wouldn't know the difference. So why, until recently, did Apple require that developers create, submit, and maintain a separate app for each of these cloud streaming games? As if Netflix had to release a new app for each movie in its catalog. The DOJ argues this rule was more than just arbitrary, that it was designed to quietly make this entire concept impractical. After all, if everything you do happens on someone else's computer, thousands of miles away, you may not need such an expensive, high-powered phone. It's a very similar argument to the last one, that Apple restricts the ability of other companies to offer services that diminish the importance of owning the latest iPhone. But there's a difference. The service in question here, cloud streaming, is good for users. It allows us to play better games, and perhaps even save some money. That makes it a much stronger argument, albeit one that affects much fewer people. In fact, Apple itself tacitly admitted this by voluntarily removing this rule several months before the lawsuit was filed. Now, the part you've been waiting for green bubbles. When you send someone a message, your iPhone first checks whether the recipient also has an iPhone. If they do, it automatically becomes a blue iMessage conversation, allowing you to do things like add reactions, send high-definition photos, and play games together. If they don't, it becomes a simple green unencrypted SMS. At least, that's what happens in Apple's Messages app. If you try doing the same using WhatsApp, Telegram, or Signal, and the recipient doesn't have a WhatsApp, Telegram, or Signal account, they'll have no way of receiving your message. Unlike Apple, third-party developers can't send or receive SMS. This is true, as far as it goes, though it's hardly a common complaint. For the most part, you know whether someone has a WhatsApp or Signal or Facebook Messenger. These apps make it easy to check. The DOJ argues that Apple wins because it has unfair advantages. It can show you a preview of your camera, for example, before you answer a video call. Other apps cannot. It also points out that green bubbles carry a social stigma. If even one member of a group chat doesn't own an iPhone, all are forced to stare at those bright green messages. But green bubbles serve a purpose, reminding you that your conversation is unencrypted. And consumers, especially teenagers, will always find subtle distinctions to make social comparisons. Never mind that Apple is not, in fact, winning. Facebook Messenger and Instagram are more popular in the United States than iMessage. WhatsApp, Snapchat, and X aren't far behind. If Apple has an unfair advantage, it doesn't appear to be working. In the US, iMessage is rapidly losing ground to WhatsApp, which has long been the dominant messaging app for most of the world. If anything, this is one of the most fierce arenas Apple competes in. To keep up with its rivals, many of which are also giant multinational corporations, it's aggressively added new features over the last few years, like reactions, edits, undo send, games, pins, memoji, and more. Whether or not Apple is complacent, iMessage isn't the reason. Next up, smartwatches. First, the government argues that Apple makes it harder to switch devices. It does this by not making its own products and services compatible with Android, including Apple Watch, iMessage, Apple Arcade, Fitness, and News. That means you'll lose these things if you ever trade your iPhone for, say, a Samsung Galaxy. 
And second, Apple withholds features from competitors on its own devices. In theory, anyone can buy any smartwatch they like. But none work nearly as seamlessly with the iPhone as the Apple Watch. And this is not because its rivals don't innovate. It's because Apple prevents them from doing so. By tying one product, the Apple Watch for instance, to another, the iPhone, neither has to compete individually on the merits. You might buy one only for access to the other. Or take Spotify. No matter how hard it tries, Spotify will never work as well with the iPhone as Apple Music, simply because it doesn't own the iPhone. Unless we expect Spotify to create its own smartphone, this is not a level playing field. The DOJ is right. This is, pretty clearly, anti-competitive. If Spotify were allowed to do everything Apple Music can, the latter would have much more competition, which might force Apple to innovate faster, benefiting you and I. But there's a catch. A completely level playing field would mean less of the deep integration that consumers love about Apple. Anyone who owns more than one of its devices understands this intuitively. The sum is greater than the parts. You can drag your cursor between Mac and iPad. You can copy on iPhone and paste on iMac. This philosophy is so deeply embedded in the company that it's reflected in Apple's internal organization. Whereas some corporations split different teams into adversarial product units, Apple incentivizes collaboration between teams to produce a more cohesive product. Now, the DOJ never acknowledges this trade-off. Instead, it seems to imply that we can have our cake and eat it too. That we don't have to stop Apple from making great, deeply integrated products to ensure a level playing field. Rather, we can simply start allowing its competitors to do the same. The best of both worlds. But what incentive does Apple have to keep innovating when it's required to share those innovations with its competitors? Let's set that aside for now. After all, perhaps the most perfectly written law or opinion can somehow overcome this issue. There's another problem. Even with all the freedom, access, and goodwill in the world, two companies will never be able to produce as cohesive an experience as one. Google will never be able to design a watch that works as seamlessly, privately, or securely with the iPhone as the company that makes the iPhone. Apple can design its products to complement one another from the outset in ways that other companies simply can't after the fact. In other words, there's a real tension here. Is more competition or deeper integration better for users? Reasonable minds will differ. What makes this uncertainty especially problematic is that the stakes couldn't possibly be higher. Cloud streaming and super apps are relatively trivial policies. Policies that can be easily changed. In fact, they were. This, on the other hand, this is Apple's entire business model. Finally, the last argument is about the wallet app. You can only use it, not for example Chase or Wells Fargo, for tap to pay, in place of a physical credit or debit card. And if a car company chooses to offer digital car keys in their iOS app, they must also make them available in Apple Wallet. Here again, Apple is using its dominant market position to dictate terms, to force Bank of America and Honda to do things they may not like. And here again, those terms are good for users, ensuring a simple, convenient experience. All our cards, keys, passes, and tickets in one easy-to-use app. No, this doesn't make Apple benevolent. It too benefits from this arrangement. But isn't that the best we can hope for? A company whose incentives are aligned with its users. We don't have to hope Apple does the right thing. We know it will because we know it likes money. And this neatly encapsulates the central problem with this lawsuit. The elephant in the room is that the vast majority of iPhone users like their iPhones. 80% to be exact are at least satisfied, according to the Independent American Customer Satisfaction Index. 
Afraid to admit this, the Department of Justice makes arguments that fly in the face of iPhone users, the supposed victims of its complaint. In the process, it loses all credibility. And that's the real tragedy of this lawsuit, that it's not better. iPhone users do have real complaints. 80% satisfaction, after all, doesn't excuse any and all transgressions. But these complaints aren't about super apps or Apple Wallet. One common and legitimate complaint, for example, is that you can't subscribe to an app like Spotify in the Spotify app. Not only that, but until recently, Spotify was prohibited from offering a button that takes users to its website, where they can subscribe. And get this, Spotify is banned from telling you this with words. It can't even communicate freely with its own users. Even today, after Apple amended its rules in response to criticism, Spotify still can't offer users a button to its website because they'd have to pay Apple a 27% commission. And, as we covered in a recent video, Spotify doesn't have a 27% profit margin to give. The result is a strange and confusing user experience. You download the Spotify app, you search everywhere, but you can't, for the life of you, find a way to give them your money. This is a direct result of Apple's rules. Rules that even giant multinational corporations really have no choice but to accept. And yet, the 88-page complaint mentions this only once, and even then, only very briefly. If the DOJ is right that Apple has a monopoly over one of the most essential objects in our modern world, the public deserves the strongest possible case against it. This is not that. For better or worse, this and its other cases against Google, Facebook, and Amazon will have a profound impact on our daily lives which makes this an important story to watch. But watch where? In today's hyper-polarized environment, in a chaotic election year, no less, it's harder than ever to be an objective, well-informed reader. Ground News, today's sponsor, was created to address this very problem. Ground News is a website and app developed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to create an easy, data-driven, and objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of its political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. To see how it works, let's look at their coverage of the DOJ's case against Ticketmaster. Right away, you can see that over 200 news outlets reported on the story. We can also see that over twice as many left-leaning sources as right-leaning are covering it. We can see that Bloomberg broke the news and that most of these sources are owned by media conglomerates. We can also easily compare headlines to see how these biases might affect framing. For example, while this story is getting a fair amount of coverage, an alarming number of websites are running the exact same headline, suggesting that one company has disproportionate control of the narrative. We can also uncover subtle differences in how the left, right, and center are telling it. The former, for instance, uses evocative words like abusing, harm, and stifle. One of the things I try to do with this channel is spotlight stories that I don't think are getting enough attention. And that's why my favorite ground news feature is called the blind spot feed. It shows you the stories that are being ignored by the left and those ignored by the right. For example, this story about China retaliating against the EU has just 9% coverage by the right. Best of all, we're currently offering 40% off the Ground News Vantage plan, which gives you unlimited access to all of their features. Subscribe today by going to ground.news slash polymatter, or by clicking the link on screen or in the description below to help support an independent platform working to make the media landscape a better and more transparent place.